Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, as always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson, your host, and for the next half hour, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different stuff that uh, hopefully you'll find interesting. Uh, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, questions, comments, whatever, send them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. If you send me email, please, as always, include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam. And uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm really terrible about answering email. So with that, let's get to it. And this week's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I got just a few things I'm going to run through very quickly, a minute or two each, because I want to spend most of the show on... Um, an edition of uh, And Another Thing, which is our occasional feature where we get away from politics for a short time. Uh, but I want to actually start first thing is that uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times, going to mention it a few times more. Uh, in the November elections, I noticed that there were three offices with candidates from the Rainbow Green Party. And uh, here in town, here in Carver, each of those candidates got about 150 votes. So there are about 150 of us out here in Carver. And uh, if uh, maybe I like the idea that we might get to know each other, uh, get together a little bit, um, and maybe even find ways to suggest that there is a progressive voice in Carver, uh, that uh, if you want, please contact me. Again, hoviating at AOL.com. And I'm going to mention that a few times more, and we'll see what happens, maybe get to know each other. Anyway, all right. We're going to open here with a bit of good news. On December 15th, the Senate confirmed Dr. Vivek Murthy to serve as Surgeon General of the United States. Now, that might seem like a rather small thing, you know, not especially important in the grand scheme of things, uh, except for one detail. Murthy's nomination had been held up for a year because of the opposition from the NRA, or as I know them, the Nutside Rabbit Brains of America. Yeah, the NRA declared that they were going to oppose his nomination, and in fact, they were going to score the vote, that is, keep a record of who voted which way as part of their determination of which senators to actively support or actively oppose during the next election. And it was so important to them because uh, Murthy had previously said, quote, guns are a health care issue, unquote. That was it. So they actively opposed his nomination his confirmation, rather, right up to the actual vote. So it took a year, but the NRA lost, and that in and of itself is enough to make it good news. All right, going on from there to one of our occasional features, this is called Everything You Need to Know. This is where you can learn a great deal about something in a very, very short time. In this case, it's everything you need to know about why cops so regularly get away with what amounts to murder. First credit words do, I didn't find this. Uh, it was found by a poster at Daily Kos who goes by the name of Blue Illini. Uh, who, he's been looking at the transcript of the grand jury testimony in, uh, in the case of Michael Brown, who was the unarmed black teenager who was killed by the white cop Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. In her testimony to the grand jury, St. Louis County Chief Medical Examiner Mary Case said, and I'm quoting, Anytime I'm involved in an officer-involved shooting, be it a fatal one or non-fatal, it is always dur during my initial investigation listed as an assault on law enforcement. Now, she insisted this in no way reflected her ultimate opinion about what uh, happened. But the fact is, by her own admission, when a cop shoots someone, the default assumption is that this is because someone attacked the cop. And that is everything you need to know. All right, one more thing here that um, including just because just I wanted to be able to say these words. 
I'm sure you heard about the fight, and it actually was a fight in Congress, over the fact that the budget bill contains a provision that undoes some of the Dodd-Frank uh, bank regulations. And as the result of this, banks will be freer to take the, again, the kind of insane risks they took that uh, almost led to the entire world, con uh, world economy imploding back in 2008. And what's more, would again leave the taxpayers on the hook to bail the banks and the bankers out of their greed-driven stupidity. I'm sure you also heard about Senator Elizabeth Warren and her attempts to block the bill unless that provision was taken out. Well, the reason I mention this here, though, is that in the House of Representatives, the opposition to the bill among Democrats, and there was a fair amount of it, was led by Nancy Pelosi. And I just wanted to say I was proud of Nancy Pelosi because I never thought those words would leave my mouth together in that order. All right, now one, one more thing. Uh, I had two candidates this week for Outrage of the Week, but um, I decided that I wasn't going to pick one this week because they were both so insanely bad that they are actually now the candidates for a brand new, sure to be highly regarded award, the Subhuman Scum of the Year. Uh, if you want to chime in on which one of these, uh, these guys you think deserves, deserves it more, you know the deal, whoviating at AOL.com. Give me your opinion. Our first nominee here is a man who may not only be the embodiment of evil, he actually kind of looks the part. The big Dick Cheney. When Chuck Todd recently asked him on Meet the Press about the 25% of prisoners in our great war on terror who turned out to be innocent, some of whom were tortured and died, Cheney's response was, I have no problem with that. No problem with torturing and killing innocent people. Now, you might think that would make him a shoe in until you meet our other candidate. His name is Jeffrey Fulmer, and he is the head of Cleveland's Patrolman's Association. Uh, he told MSNBC, MSNBC host um, Ari, uh, Ari Melber recently that when the cops shot, who shot down 17-year-old uh, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, uh, by the way, Fulmer kept referring to Tamir Rice as the male uh, when the cops shot him down, literally two seconds after coming screeching up to him in their car, he said they unquestionably, absolutely did nothing wrong. They were absolutely justified. In fact, sounding like a Holocaust denier who insists they can't see any evidence of the death camps, even when it's literally dropped in their laps, uh, he actually insisted that the video, his words, clearly shows the cops did the right thing when they shot Tamir Rice. And what's more, the real victim here are the other cops of Cleveland who are being disrespected by demands for justice. Okay, you tell me who you think you should, uh, should get that award, and I'll pass it out next week. Now, for the rest of the show, we're going to move away from that. We're going to go to something... Eh, Almost entirely non-political. And another thing. This is usually where we talk about some cool science stuff, but this year it's going to be some cool history stuff. Um, this year I'm going to give you a very brief history of Christmas, or more specifically, answer the question, why is Christmas on December 25th? Now, right at the top, you have to realize something. Based on how we celebrate this season, how we, and by that I mean Americans, and to an even greater extent Europeans, how we engage in and celebrate the season, the traditions we embrace and that we express, um, by that traditions, by that mean of celebrating uh, this, this is Christmas. And this is Christmas. And this is Christmas. And this. And this. And this. But this is not. Because you know those people who go around saying that Jesus is the reason for the season? He isn't, and he never was. The season is because of astronomical patterns. Now that half of you are smirking and the other half are composing nasty emails, I'll explain. 
Until recently, uh, people were much more aware of the m motions of the sun and the moon and the stars and the patterns and so on uh, and than pretty much anybody is now unless you were a really dedicated stargazer or an astronomer. Because keeping track of those kind of movements was necessary. It was a necessary part of your life. They were signs of the changing of the seasons. They told you when it was time to plant, when it was time to harvest, when the game was going to be plentiful. They were like your almanacs, your seasonal calendars. Now, some of that awareness of the stars and the sun and the moon and so on lives on in popular expressions and popular mythology. For example, did you ever wonder why the hot, humid days of July and August are called the dog days? Well, it's because ancient peoples, by their observations, were able to realize that the star, which we call Sirius, which was at its highest point in the sky in the middle of the night, in the middle of winter, was also at its highest point in the sky in the middle of the day, in the middle of summer. It moved through the sky with the sun. Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation Canis Major, the big dog, and Sirius is actually known as the dog star. So those days were the dog days. All right, but getting back to the real point here, uh, in prehistoric times and even right up into, you know, well into recorded history, people believed that things like the sun and the moon and so on acted willfully or were directed by gods who acted willfully. And each year watching the sun get lower and lower in the sky each day as winter approached, a fear developed that one of these years the sun was going to keep on dropping until it disappeared below the horizon, leaving you in perpetual cold and dark. So each year, when the sun stopped its descent and started to rise in the sky each day, a little higher each day, uh, this became a cause for celebration because it was a promise of the continuance of life and the return of spring. It's the time of the winter solstice. That occurs in the northern hemisphere, depending upon exactly where you are, around December 21st or 22nd. Solstice is derived from two Latin words, sol and sestira, which together actually mean the sun stands still, which is what it appears to do at the solstice. All over the Northern Hemisphere, this was a time to celebrate. Ancient Egypt had solstice celebrations, ancient Greece did. In fact, the earliest uh, Grecian celebrations uh, involved a human sacrifice. The Druids uh, celebrated it, it was celebrated in Iran. Uh, Native American peoples, including the Pueblo and the Hopi, had their own solstice celebrations. In pagan Scandinavia, the, the winter festival was called Yule. Great Yule logs were burned. Uh, people drank mead around bonfires, listening to tales of great deeds of years gone by. A boar was sacrificed to the chief god Odin, who put on a broad-brimmed hat, a magic blue cloak, and sped around the entire world on his great white horse. Mistletoe was a sacred plant because it grew on the most sacred tree, the oak, and sprigs of mistletoe were cut and families hung them over their doors for good luck. This, by the way, is the, our first reminder. There'll be at least one more. It's our first reminder of the fact that a lot of our holiday traditions, including the Yule Tide, which means like the time of the Yule, uh, they're drawn from pagan ones, including things like decorating with garlands, wreaths, the Christmas tree itself and the guy who could magically fly around the entire world in the course of one night. For the date of Christmas, though, uh, now we're getting into the space that lies between history and interpretation. Because no one knows the exact date that Jesus was born. No one even knows for sure the season he was born. Uh, to the extent that the Bible can be trusted as a source, we can be confident that he, in fact, was not born in the winter because shepherds did not watch their flocks by night in the winter. Their flocks were generally corralled. In fact, the time it was most common to watch your flocks by night was um, in the spring because newborn lambs needed protection against wolves. Now, that has led some to argue that Jesus must have been born in the spring, but frankly, that is a really thin reed on which to base such a big conclusion uh, or to build any kind of foundation. All right, we're going to get back to this right after the break.
And we're back, still talking about, and another thing, why is Christmas on December 25th? The earliest known use of the word, in English, of the word Christ Mass, or the Feast of Christ, Christmas, uh, was on a list of feast days with mass days that was set down in England in 1038, a thousand years after Jesus died. And no celebrations, no saints days, no days of any sort were listed for December 25th. In fact, not only did early church leaders, and we're talking here second or third century CE here, not only did early ch church leaders argue about when Jesus was born, I mean, the options included January 2nd, March 21st, March 25th, April 18th, April 19th, May 20th, May 28th, November 17th, November 20th, and yes, December 25th. Some, such as Oregon, uh, argued that the whole thing was pointless and wrong because it shouldn't be celebrated at all. Celebrating birthdays, he said, was for pagan gods, not for the one true God. Even so, by the mid-third century, the idea for having a day to celebrate the birth of Jesus was, was getting established. But even so, it took a considerable length of time for that date to become formalized and a day to be fixed. In 313, Constantine the Great legally allowed Christianity in the Roman Empire. Actually, in fact, he went considerably beyond that. The declaration actually said, quote, it was proper that the Christians and all others should have liberty to follow that mode of religion which to each of them appeared best, which actually shows a lot more tolerance than some folks do here today, including our right-wing so-called Christians, who every year about this time take great delight in coming on as the oppressed victims under the relentless assault of the atheistic socialist accords, even though Christians make up 78% of the U.S. population. Anyway, the first recorded date of the birth of Jesus being celebrated on December 25th was not until 336, 300 years after Jesus died. A few years after that, it was after that, Pope Julius I officially declared that the birth of Jesus would be celebrated on December 25th. But we're still talking about why that date was chosen. By, and, and by a uh, sidebar here, quick sidebar. Contrary to con uh, popular belief, Constantine did not become a Christian, uh, did not get baptized until shortly before his death in 337. And Christianity did not become the official religion of Rome until 380, 43 years after his death. But anyway, get, getting back to the point, why was December 25th the date ultimately chosen? That was the question, after all. Well, to really determine that, what we have to remember is that all these events are taking place in Rome, which had become the nerve center for organized Christianity. And that date of December 25th brings us back to the winter solstice. The Romans, like many other ancient peoples, had winter solstice celebrations. In Rome, it was called Saturnalia. Now, this was originally a feast day to the god Saturn, but over time it grew into be a gigantic fair and festival of the home. It began with the sacrifice of a pig, and it involved like riotous merrymaking, feasting, gambling. Houses were decorated with laurels and evergreens. Schools were closed. The army rested. Uh, no prisoners were executed. Friends visited one another with good luck gifts of fruit and cakes and candles and dolls and jewelry and incense and so on. Temples were decorated with evergreens. People danced through the streets uh, wearing, with their faces blackened or wearing masks and fantastic hats. Masters feasted with their slaves who could say and do what they liked. Supposedly, anyway. I mean, I doubt they really felt free to push the privilege very far since in a day or a couple of days they go back to being ordinary slaves, but, you know, hypothetically, they could. Anyway. Uh, notice something else here, by the way. Uh, some of the traditions, decorating your home, laurels, visiting friends, giving gifts, holiday parties. These were not Christian traditions. They were Roman ones, pagan ones. Now, the old Roman goddess of the solstice was Angerona, whose festival day, logically enough for a goddess of the solstice, was December 21st. But when Mithraism, uh, personified by the god Mithra, was introduced to Rome, the goddess was largely supplanted in favor of Mithra's day of seasonal rebirth, which was December 25th. 
Mithra, himself a composite of earlier beliefs, became amalgamated with a Roman sun god named Solus Indigene, uh, a god which in turn came from the Pelasgian titan of light named Helios. This new being, this composite of two composites, was Solus Invicta, the invincible sun, and Mithra's day became Disnatalis Solus Invicti, the birthday of the, un of the unconquerable sun. When the Emperor Aurelian proclaimed Mithraism the official religion of Rome in 274, the day became an official holiday. All right, so put all this together. Before Constantine the Great issued his Edict of Milan, being a Christian in Rome could get you killed. Refusal to participate in the official cult, the imperial cult, was considered treason. During the great persecution carried out by the Emperor Diocletian between 303 and 311, Christian buildings in the home of Christians were torn down, their sacred books were collected and burned, the Christians themselves were arrested, tortured, mutilated, burned, starved, killed, and condemned to gladiatorial contests in the arena for the amusement of the better sorts. So if you as a Christian in Rome wanted to celebrate the birth of the man you regarded as your savior, and by this time the idea of having such a celebration was pretty well established. Well, if you wanted to do that, you had to hide it. So since the time is purely symbolic and basically arbitrarily chosen because no one knows the actual date for certain and it's really based on tradition and nothing more, I mean, at the same time, you know, think of all the other saints' days in the Christian calendar. Uh, on none of those days is there an assertion being made that that person was born on that date. This is just the date that you know, you recognize them, you whatever. And, and so, you know, choosing a day to note the birth of Jesus had nothing to do with whether or not he was actually born on that day. Well, if you're going to do that, and again, the actual date is like arbitrary, um, what better time to do it than during Saturnalia at a time when everybody else was celebrating so nobody would notice? And what better day to pick than December 25th when the birthday of the unconquerable sun could be thought of as the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Indeed, according to, uh, to St. John Chrysostom, who was the bishop of the Archbishop of Constantinople, he was writing in the late 4th or very early 5th centuries, he said, quote, the Roman Church purposefully placed the keeping of Christmas between two popular folk festivals, Saturnalia and the Collins of January, in order to give Christians something to celebrate about undisturbed while others were engaged in secular merrymaking. By the year 354 CE, December 25th had been accepted in Rome as the day of the Feast of Christ, Christmas. Uh, gradually, most of the Christian church agreed. Once Christianity became the legal religion of Rome, uh, the official religion of Rome in 380, the church began appropriating what old pagan customs it could, with the result that the merrymaking side of Saturnalia was adopted and adapted to the observance of Christ uh, Christmas. So, friends, that is why Christmas is on December 25th, because Christians first hid within, then adopted, then adapted pagan celebrations of the winter solstice. By 1100 CE, Christmas was the peak celebration of the year for all of Europe. But let me finish this up by saying that even though the idea was not universally accepted, I, uh, uh, I should say that even then, rather, the idea is not universally accepted, uh, Oregon's conviction that celebrating the birth of a god was for pagan gods, not for the one true god, uh, that idea persisted among conservative Christians for centuries. Uh, in fact, the, the separatists who settled Plymouth and the Puritans who settled Boston embraced exactly that idea. They regarded Christmas as a pagan celebration with no biblical justification. In fact, there were laws against it. In his journal entry for 1621, Plymouth Colony Governor William Bradford, writing about 10 or 12 years later, recalled what he called a passage rather of mirth than of weight. I'm quoting the passage. On the day called Christmas Day, the governor called them out to work as was used, but most of this new company, and this actually refers to a group of people who had arrived in Plymouth the month before, November of 1621, uh, most of this new company excused themselves and said it went against their consciences to work on that day. So the governor told them that if they made it a matter of conscience, he would spare them till they were better informed. 
So he led away the rest and left them. But when they came home at noon from their work, he found them in the street at play openly, some pitching the bar and some at stool ball and such like sports. So he went to them and took away their implements and told them it was against his conscience that they should play and others work. If they made the keeping of it a matter of devotion, let them keep to their houses, but there should be no gaming or reveling in the streets, since which time nothing's been attempted that way, at least openly. And it wasn't just here in the colonies either. In 1647, Great Britain's Puritan-dominated parliament abolished the feats of Christmas, Easter, and Whitsun, the latter of which is known in the U.S. as Pentecost. In 1659, the Mass Bay Colony, that is, Boston, banned celebrating Christmas altogether. The ban remained in place for 22 years until 1681, and even then it was a governor appointed by the restored monarchy of Great Britain that actually revoked it. Um, even then, despite the revocation, the first recorded celebration of Christmas in Boston wasn't for another five years in 1686. In fact, for a lot of years, Thanksgiving remained the most important seasonal holiday in New England. Even in other parts of the country, Christmas did not become a major celebration until later, um, a, a religious revival in the early 1800s spurred renewed interest in Christmas, particularly in the South this was. But it wasn't until 1837 that Louisiana became the first state in the Union to make this an official holiday. And even on that, New England continued to lag behind. In Plymouth, the first time Christmas is ever mentioned in the town's oldest newspaper was in 1825. As late as 1856, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow could write that, quoting, the old Puritan feeling prevents Christmas from being a cheerful, hearty holiday. Uh, but, he said, we are in a transition state. And in fact, so it was a transition state. By 1860, just a few years later, that same Plymouth newspaper that I mentioned was filled with ads for Christmas presents. And by the end of the 1800s, Christmas was as much a part of Plymouth as it had by then become for the rest of the country. So, in the spirit of Christmas, in the spirit of Constantine and religious tolerance, let me say Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah, happy Festivus. For all the atheists like me and all the pagans out there, happy winter solstice. And all of us, happy holidays. Because like the man in the story said, we are halfway out of the dark. That's it. You have the best holidays you can. Uh, we probably will not have a show next week. Um, so take a week off. Enjoy your holiday. Enjoy everything. And uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, have the best weeks you possibly can. Peace.